Have you ever wanted to play a landless adventure in Sat Constantinople, or work as a wandering missionary in LARP's The Second Coming of Jesus Christ? If so, you're in luck, because Paradox has just dropped potentially one of the largest dev diaries in existence, and I wanted to take the time to cover the new landless gameplay that is coming to CK3 with Roads to Power, the next expansion. As a disclaimer, I was originally going to make a single video for landless gameplay, but this dev diary spans well over 10 pages worth of content, and this is only part one of two. With that out of the way, landless is probably one of the most commonly used words in a CK3 player's vocabulary outside of incest and primogeniture. One of the reasons that this dev diary is so long is likely due to Paradox's promises to include more detailed dev diaries, and I'm certain that there would have been a meltdown on social media if this wasn't exhaustive. If you play with Roads to Power installed, you'll have the option to start as a landed character or venture across the map as a mercenary. Instead of staying cooped up in the brothel all day though, landless adventurers have tents that act as their hub, similar to how landed characters typically reside in individual counties. What's different is how camps develop for landless gameplay. These camps can be easily moved to different locations, and they also come with their own objectives and flavor. Just like in real life, you too can simulate being a wage slave with a corporate 9-to-5 in Crusader Kings 3. New scroll icons on the map indicate contracts that characters can take in order to earn a living. Contracts have varying difficulty depending on the type of job and who is assigning it. Likewise, jobs sent out by the Emperor are going to pay far more than a lowly count. Provisions are the new resource that was teased in the prior dev diaries, and the petty lowborns require sustenance in order to survive, unlike their purebred albino overlords. This is represented in the form of an apple icon. Alongside prestige, gold, and piety, it is a new resource that landless characters will need to keep track of. Mercenaries aren't entirely landless though, technically speaking. They have a domicile which is represented with a new interface, and they can spend gold freely to upgrade and customize certain improvements. Over time, these domiciles can be fitted to synergize with certain attributes. Prestige acts as a sort of reputation meter for landless characters, and it seems to have a far more measurable impact on how they interact with contracts compared to counts and higher. This is important for landed characters when making decisions, but it is vital that you are playing as a mercenary. More prestige means getting access to better contracts from wealthier patrons. The King of England isn't going to trust someone with no internship experience to clear out a camp of bandits that is disrupting his trade network, after all. And that's what makes provisions so important. All of the best contracts aren't going to stay in one place. As kingdoms rise and fall, you'll have to move across Europe, Asia, or Africa to gain wealth and make a name for yourself. This, of course, will require having a significant food supply, and if you are low on provisions, it will become increasingly difficult to travel. It also becomes harder to travel the more you upgrade your camp. So as you grow, you will want to think more about how you plan your next moves, which is a nice way to add in skill and complexity to landless gameplay if you want to ride things out. All of this involves using the Activities panel, which was first introduced in Tours and Tournaments. I like that the developers are using previously existing mechanics to build a stronger foundation for free and paid content, instead of starting from scratch each time with new expansions like CK2. I think this is a great compromise for players that are undecided on where they want to start out. Not every realm is destabilized in the start dates, and waiting around before becoming a landlord character for a few hundred years should be a much more dynamic experience, and I am a huge sucker for enhancements to replayability. One of my biggest concerns coming into the dev diary was that mercenaries were only going to be martially inclined, which does make sense. You aren't going to care about stewardship or diplomacy as much if you are leading an army to sack some poor guy's capital because he didn't pay rent. Despite this, contracts are fairly diverse from what we've seen so far. You can see with the screenshot here that there are multiple approaches to completing the task, which means that the player character can choose to use a different attribute depending on how they want to complete the task at hand. As a counterbalance to certain illegal contracts, like this one here, you may face certain penalties if you fail or are caught. Outside of killing, characters can take contracts for educating children, stealing money from certain characters, or working for the IRS and collecting taxes, though there isn't that much of a difference between the latter, in my opinion. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a catch here in that only the AI will offer mercenary contracts. That is to say, you won't be recruiting adventurers to educate your children, but you can temporarily hire them as a retinue. I think this will probably be the biggest issue players have with the new expansion, and I can see where a lot of people are coming from. Even without players being able to offer contracts, this is still a huge amount of content to push out, and there is a lot of additional balancing that might need to be done when taking AI adventurers into consideration. Regardless, I still find it disappointing. The silver lining to this is that CK3 had more time to add in different contract types, and there are even varying punishments depending on failure to complete said contracts. If you so choose, you can roleplay as Saul Goodman, going around and negotiating border disputes with an absurdly high stewardship stat, likely thanks to inbreeding. Free-to-play players will be excited to learn that modders can implement contracts without requiring the DLC. However, the vanilla version of the game, that is to say unmodded, will not grant you access to contracts if you haven't forked over $30 yet. 
So how do contracts themselves work exactly? Starting out as a landless adventurer, you'll click on one of the scrolls scattered across the map and get a greeting with a pop-up window. Most importantly, the job will tell you what attributes you need to succeed. If you are Saul Goodman, first of his name, then it's going to be a lot easier to take contracts that oversee construction instead of levying an army. Scheme contracts are a type of contract that characters will rely on to earn coin. In this example, we have a stewardship contract that involves making sure a building is properly built. How you choose to navigate this task is up to you, but there is the same amount of freedom in these contracts as there are in regular schemes like seduction and romance. If you perform particularly well, you may get a bonus reward on top of your pre-existing wage. When you first arrive at the job location, you can choose to assign different agents to assist with the success rate, much akin to murder plots. As overseer of these plots, you can choose to assign guests from your own camp, but the caveat is that they need to actually get along. Presumably, if you have conflicting traits, it is up to you to ensure that plans don't go awry and mess up your contract, thereby costing you your hard-earned prestige and reputation. Of course, while venturing to new lands, you'll encounter different characters. In the screenshots here, the dev decided to take on a Tengri Wanderer, which in turn helped them speed up construction efforts. The player can decide whenever they want to execute the scheme, which has a meter that displays the success rate. As there are deadlines, it's in the player's interest to complete these contracts sooner rather than later. We can see with the next contract that rewards do indeed vary. This contract offers less gold, but more provisions to compensate. Interestingly, with certain contract types like this one, you can actually loan out followers and trust that they do a good job, while you go off to complete other contracts. Unlike schemes, event contracts are more of a direct attribute check instead of filling out a progress bar. If you are very skilled and have a learning score of 30, then it makes sense to take event contracts and never look back. Alternatively, if there is a scheme contract that offers a significant amount of gold or prestige and you have several skilled followers, then it may be pragmatic to take it. Event contracts also seem to have more ways to solve them, and are therefore less straightforward. The next contract type is a blend between the two, and involves interacting directly with activities. If you want to get from one place to another and just so have spare room in your caravan, travel contracts involve transporting valuable clientele in exchange for gold. Here, the character is able to decide whether or not they want to move their camp or loop back around once the mission is completed. In this image, the adventurer travels through Persia during the Intermezzo, which makes the potential reward of 44 gold all too measly for such a massive undertaking. These contracts don't seem to rely heavily on one specific skill, but rather a myriad of decisions to ensure that you reach your destination safely and on time. On top of this, the guest also acts similar to a follower, meaning that you need to cater to them in the interest of getting paid and ensure that they don't do anything stupid. Counselor contracts are more in line with the scheme contracts that we saw earlier. While there hasn't been too much detail about what distinguishes a counselor contract, it appears that they focus more on increasing the success rate of individual tasks that a council member is performing for their liege. In this example, the player takes a job to increase county control, which is a fairly straightforward ticker for landed characters. On the flip side, this type of contract is a faster way to get access to a higher level liege that you may not have access to otherwise with your current prestige level. If you take an even closer look, the event actually provides several options on handling the peasants. You can either move your camp closer for a higher risk, or stay in a different county and handle things from there. Either way, success depends on gathering peasant support, but you could also turn the tide of peasants against their liege and potentially stage a revolt. The last type of contract, mercenary contracts, are quite simple from a glance. You have a big hammer, someone in way over their head pays you money to whack someone, and you do just that. Something interesting that popped up in one of the screenshots is that dismissed followers can come back to your camp. Whether it takes 1 or 20 years, these characters can come to you with new traits, attributes, and even religions. This didn't seem to be the case here, but it opens up an entirely new way to handle characters that have more freedom unlike courtiers. The mercenary mission goes to plan, with a few decisive battles later resulting in the army being able to liberate an occupied province. This is in part thanks due to how many troops the player has acquired up to this point after 10 years of adventuring, but I think this opens up an incredible amount of opportunities to some skullduggery depending on how devious the players are feeling. What if the liege doesn't have enough money? What if they refuse payment altogether because they are greedy? Potentially, you could sack their capital and depose them altogether, but this is just me theorizing. Let me know what you think about the contract type so far in the comments down below. The role of patrons is a new feature added with Roads to Power that has larger implications for landless gameplay. If you've been looking closely at the screenshots thus far, you may have noticed that successful contracts have resulted in quest givers being added to this list. But what exactly is the role of patrons? To put it quite simply, it's a long list of the CK3 equivalent of OnlyFans or Patreon supporters that you have a past history with. If you build enough opinion with them, you can choose to exchange that opinion for favors, artifacts, troops, or even possibly land if you decide to settle down after some hard work in the brothel. With brothels in mind, every realm has a seedy underbelly, and CK3 is expanding the amount of ways that you can screw over other characters. 
Moral compasses are a source of weakness, after all, and becoming a murder hobo is completely ethical as long as you are not caught. Likewise, criminal contracts can make you eligible for imprisonment depending on failure, and you cannot add characters that you cross to your role of patrons, for obvious reasons. Additionally, you will also acquire the new gallows bait trait. If you perform a contract for Peter Baelish and burn someone's property down, people will begin to have a negative opinion of you as a cutthroat and a sellsword. Aside from the negative opinion modifier, characters with the gallows bait trait can become surprisingly diversified. Even though both a hedge fund manager and a YouTube content creator such as yours truly are criminal in nature, they have very different skill sets. This is separated into the branches of bandit, trickster, thief, poacher, and marauder, acting like the hunter trait that is leveled up through activities. But if you are weak of heart and wish to reform yourself, then you have multiple options through the wipe slate decision. The easiest route is going to be paying your back taxes to Uncle Sam and forking over some prestige, but some of the more nuanced options are going to be revealed in the second dev diary. With travel, provisions are ever increasingly important and you can spend your earnings on adding improvements to the camp, like in the form of a baggage train which can boost provision capacity. Onagers aren't going to be eating as much as a full-grown horse, but if rations are low, why not have more horsemen for a two-in-one meal deal? This is a question to save for the cons. On the topic of cons, hunting and falconry can also be reliable ways to obtain provisions while leveling up other traits. In the main camp menu, certain upgrades can help with managing provisions, while others may improve disease resistance or even trade some boons for some buffs like we can see here with Golden Plague Resistance. While at camp, you'll need to manage your own internal tent politics like a miniature Game of Thrones reality show. Followers are broken up into three categories based on their opinion of you. The amount of individuals in the supporter, complacent, and detractor tiers affect the overall camp temperament, which in turn can boost or hinder your army strength and scheme success. Depending on individual character traits, you will need to be more careful with who you choose to sleep with and whether or not they have useful allies. Dismissing someone from your camp who is friends with half of your followers could very well cause all of them to leave, which has drastic repercussions. Although they will remain largely the same for landed characters, landless gameplay involves picking a lifestyle tree that is more suitable for your adventures. All of this could be a plot by the devs to make the torture tree relevant for once, but I digress. Murder hobos can now double their gold rewards with the Crime Pays perk, and theologians can… spread the word of God. I don't know why exactly you would want to go around and preach about the virtues of sibling marriage, but theoretical Zoroastrian characters could very well turn realms into incest fest with the right political manipulation. I really hope to see some leeway for modders to allow the creation of entirely new religions or sects altogether to see some wacky interactions, but we'll see as things develop. Lisan al Gaib could be upon us. Where the new lifestyle trees and camp improvements collide is with unique buildings like the Portable Shrine, which allows you to convert your followers into devout jihadists or whatever extremist sect you're cooking up. If you want to take things as they come, consider hosting a camp revelry with your followers to improve morale and get to know them better. Adventurers cannot host feasts or other large-scale activities, but there are opportunities to liven up the camp, so to speak. If you go far enough down certain trees, you can even request feasts and other events from your liege. All in all, Roads to Power will update over 900 events, 200 decisions, and 160 plus character interactions when it drops in September. To close out this absolute behemoth of a dev diary, let's talk about the elephant in the room, close relationships. If you decided to touch grass and fall in love with one of your followers, then you may have children which can inherit your camp and all of the accompanying titles. Once you die, your oldest child that is a follower will inherit. If you are childless, your next closest relative that is a follower will inherit. Otherwise, the character with the highest prowess inherits. If you wish to directly designate a successor, they will become your dynasty and create their own house immediately. Next week we'll get into some of the heavier details such as land acquisition, but I wanted to look at some of the Q&A responses before closing out the video, which can be quite extensive. First and foremost, adventurers can start new faiths, but the developers say that it will be less grand. What they mean by this is purely up to speculation, but I imagine that there will need to be significantly more investment from characters before you get people to actually convert to your religion. This sounds like something you would do after having several high-profile titles on your payroll, as newly converted counts and dukes would be easily subject to title revocation and or holy wars. Adventurers share a big parallel with CK2 characters with the new option to set long-term goals for camps. Back in CK2, characters could choose to build war chests, get married, and conquer new titles, among other options. I hope this is eventually expanded to landed characters, because goals like this in the last game are not as incorporated into the core gameplay mechanics, which I find disappointing. Something that will be especially exciting for players that like historical characters is the addition of figures like El Cid, who are optional adventurers. This isn't going to be the only starting adventurer, with several others being added to the starting menu, but I'd love to hear who you'd think would be a fun addition to start out as in the comments section. The developers provided additional clarity on how you can become an adventurer and who gets to start out as one. There also seems to be events that will allow you to become landless as a landed character, but that will likely be fleshed out in an additional dev diary. 
There was a lot of further debate and some anguish in the responses surrounding AI adventurers. While the general defense of this decision comes in the form of wanting to preserve the quote-unquote experience, I think it makes more sense from a performance angle. Stellaris took a massive hit when it added a pop system, and I can't imagine the effect that several hundred AI characters roaming around the map would have. Furthermore, assuming this would allow more mercenaries to exist on the map as independent, roaming bands, certain religions slash cultures with mercenary discounts would be absolutely insufferable to deal with, I would think. If you want to see the full Q&A response, I'll link it in the description, but this video is probably one of the biggest yet for CK3, and it's been a while since I've posted. Let me know if you like the new contract system and what your first start will be with the new update. I hope you like this video, and I plan on covering more CK3 videos in Civ 7 hopefully once things pick up. I try to read every comment, and it really makes my day getting to see all of your insights that I miss out on. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you later. Peace.